All right, I think we'll get started. I think people will be coming in and out. Um, I want to welcome you all to this celebration um, of Patrice Jones, who many of you know um, as the co-founder of Vine Sanctuary and as one of our more important strategists and campaigners for animal liberation amongst other social justice issues. Um, and she's also a theorist and a writer. Um, and on this occasion of her 60th birthday, and I'm so proud of her for letting us all say it's her 60th birthday, um, we thought it would be a great opportunity to reflect on some of her ideas. She has many, many ideas. We could talk about them for such a long time, but we're gonna just spend the afternoon doing that. I also wanted to mention um, for those of you um, who don't know yet, um, that there's an important fundraiser happening for Vine Sanctuary this month um, in honor of Patrice's 60th birthday. And if you go to vinesanctuary.org, um, you can donate and the donations are gonna be matched. Um, and so it's a really important time and I think it will be great um, for everybody to, I don't know, whatever you can spare will be uh, would be really useful, uh, especially as the sanctuary goes into the hard winter months. Um, today we have three exciting speakers and me uh, to talk briefly about how to think with and about Patrice's ideas. And so you have, I hope you've seen the schedule um, and um, basically what's going to happen is I'm going to introduce everybody before um, they speak. And we're gonna go um, sort of through the, each speaker and then open, uh, then Patrice will respond and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Um, so, but in the process of going forward, please feel free to put questions into the chat and we'll try to gather them to organize them at um, the end of the discussion. I also would like to ask um, that you please stay muted until the discussion time uh, causes a lot of reverb and distraction. Um, and so um, that would be really useful. Okay, uh, without too much further ado, I think um, we'll be continuing to put the um, Vine Sanctuary um, link in the chat as well uh, for ease. Um, so keep your eye there too. Um, so let me start um, by introducing uh, our first speaker, Sue Donaldson, who um, is an author and activist from Kingston, Ontario. She's the co-author of a multi-species ethnography of Vine Sanctuary and many other important articles. She's also the co-author with Will Kimlicka of the extremely important book, Zoopolis, a, po a Political Theory of Animal Rights. She's the co-founder of Animals in Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple um, at Queen's University in Ontario. Um, and I'm just gonna get us started. Thanks, Sue. Thank you, Laurie. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Laurie, and for organizing uh, this event. I think that celebrating Patrice is just the most wonderful reason for us all to come together. Uh, and I feel really honored to take part today. Um, so I had the great good fortune uh, to meet Patrice in person uh, for the first time in 2013. And that was during a short visit to Vine Sanctuary with five colleagues. It was just a one day visit, but it turned out to be hugely uh, inspiring and influential for my subsequent research uh, and writing. I'll talk more about that in a moment, but I should say that before this in-person meeting, I had come across a 2008 paper of Patrice's called Strategic Analysis of Animal Welfare mm -hmm. Legislation, a Guide for the Perplexed. Will Kimmick and I were just finishing our book Zoopolis at that time, and we were formulating our own ideas about animals, agency, and individual and collective self-determination. Uh, we were deeply concerned with then dominant animal rights and liberation theories that viewed justice and care uh, often as things we did for animals, as opposed to something uh, that we might create or do with or alongside animals who have their own lives to lead, their own ways, their own perspectives, their own ideas about what matters, their own proposals for how we might get on, 
uh, and the fundamental right to make or participate in such decisions for themselves as self-determining beings uh, and members of self-determining communities. So I was thrilled to come across Patrice's paper and to realize that others shared these worries and indeed had been thinking about them uh, for some time. And not just in abstract terms, uh, but as part of an evolving and deeply grounded praxis. In case you haven't read it, uh, Patrice's paper was in part an intervention into the uh, heated strategic debate between animal welfareists and abolitionists. And one of the things that Patrice pointed out is that the two camps in this debate, despite seeing themselves as fierce opponents, were in fact operating from a very similar premise, namely that it's up to humans to decide what the best state of affairs uh, would be for animals in general, and then to bring about that state of affairs on their behalf. Welfareists and abolitionists disagreed about the nature of that state of affairs and whether to bring it about incrementally or in a more non, uh, uh, uncompromising manner. Uh, but they were on the same wavelength when it came to humans being the knowers and deciders and animals being the passive recipients of human decisions. Neither side talked about asking animals what they might want or even trying very hard to consider the perspectives of the actual living animals who would be affected by human proposals and interventions. Like an individual hen in a battery operation, for example, in deference to long-term abolitionist strategy, she would be required in the short term to endure her tiny cage rather than a somewhat larger one proposed under welfare legislation, say. But what might she say about that if, if we asked her about that trade-off? In contrast to positioning humans as the inevitable deciders, Patrice emphasized that animals have knowledge and experience, they have voices and perspectives on what would make their lives go better or worse, and they have privileged access to crucial questions about their well being. This doesn't mean that they don't need our advocacy, but it does mean that when advocates want to help animals, we need to engage with those we're trying to support, or at least think very carefully about their situations and perspectives case by case instead of making categorical decisions according to human theories of preferred outcomes or states of affairs. It's remarkable to me that that was quite a radical position at the time that Patrice was staking out, and indeed it continues to be. So I'd just like to read a few quotes from Patrice's paper just to give you a, a flavor of the grounding assumptions. I'm quoting here, animals have voices, Animals ought to be recognized as the subjects rather than the objects of animal liberation. Liberation includes self-determination and freedom. And so if we really uh, believe that animals deserve self-determination, then we must listen to them when they say what they want. And fourth quote, uh, different animals might have different ideas about what rights matter and different priorities in the struggle from human oppression. That's just a sampling, but it touches on some of the points I'll be developing later. I should also note that beyond laying out these guiding principles, uh, Patrice's paper provides an extremely helpful template for thinking through uh, strategic choices and then applies this uh, to the aforementioned case of hens and, and battery cages. I don't know if Patrice would modify the analysis at this stage, but I think it stands up very well um, almost 15 years later. Okay, so that paper was my introduction to Patrice's work. And now I'm sure many of you have had the following kind of experience. Uh, you read something, you think it's brilliant, then you meet the person, uh, the author in person and suffer a crushing disappointment when you realize that there's no meaningful connection between the ideas they espouse on paper and the way they actually live their lives and work for change. Fortunately, that first trip to Vine in 2013 uh, was completely the opposite. Not only could I see that the community established by Patrice and Miriam and Cheryl and the other residents of Vine exemplified the principles that Patrice wrote about in her various writings, but that Vine was very much a living and evolving community. In other words, it was apparent how Patrice's views uh, theoretical views were not only operating on the ground, but also leaping forward in really exciting ways, uh, whether that concerned how to engage the larger Springfield and Vermont uh, communities and political economies, um, how to carry forth minds intersecting ecofeminist, queer, decolonizing, and anti-racist commitments, or most germane to my remarks uh, today, 
how to foster a community in which formerly farmed animals were able to explore and express how they wanted to live and what they had to say about, well, about many things, about their friendships, sexuality and desires, uh, their views about uh, freedom versus risk and responsibility, their relations with wild animals and, and many other things. There's quite simply no shortcut to this process of asking animals. If we take seriously that animals are the subjects of animal liberation and have rights to self-determination, then we have to create vine-like conditions to even begin to explore what liberation and future relations might look like. It sometimes happens in post-talk Q&A sessions that people express some frustration with me when they ask whether such and such uh, is good for animals. And I answer, well, which animals and why don't we ask them? It just seems very hard for us humans to abandon the idea that we can think our way to the answers uh, without asking animals themselves. And indeed that we have the right and responsibility to decide what matters for them. But it's more complicated than simply asking animals because if we want to ask them, uh, we we'll have to create the circumstances in which it is possible to ask and for them to answer in meaningful ways. Genuine dialogue, let alone democratic relations, require a whole enabling environment, social and material. And this starts with basic security, the way that Vine residents come to realize they are finally in a situation free from arbitrary human violence and malevolent control of, uh, of their lives. It requires building on this basic security by developing trust, recognition of mutual responsiveness, and repertoires of communicative tools and practices, and by creating an environment rich and open and developmental possibilities. At the same time, it requires dismantling ideologies and inherited social practices that constrain and distort those possibilities. So this is a complex ongoing process requiring not just social critique, but on the ground, time, patience, ingenuity, sensitive attention, and a serious dose of humility. It requires that humans step back from asserting control and decision. And this, of course, goes to the heart of politics, of sharing power. It is part of what makes Vine so unique, uh, not just the demonstrable care and compassion for animals, which I've witnessed in many sanctuary contexts, but the commitment to sharing power with animals, which I have witnessed less often. So I was hugely inspired by that short visit to Vine and what I learned from Patrice and the community and from reading her work. As I said, it significantly shaped my subsequent work on animal agencies, human animal politics and democracy. I returned to Vine in uh, April, 2018, a very wet um, late April uh, with Will and a group of grad students for a four day research visit. It was an amazing experience and I'll say more about it in a moment. But first, I'd like to express my uh, gratitude to Patrice on several fronts. I've uh, visited and worked with many sanctuaries over the years, and I understand how hard it is for them to trust researchers and the academic process. Operating a sanctuary is a uh, demanding, precarious, often overwhelming undertaking, an emotional roller coaster. Under such challenging circumstances, who needs someone coming from the outside to observe and scrutinize and in some way appropriate this work? I've had sanctuaries say no to the request to establish a research partnership, and I completely understand this reluctance. So I hugely admire that Patrice has been willing to open up the community to outsiders, uh, even though we will inevitably get lots of things wrong in our efforts to understand and derive insights. In addition to putting her trust in this process and resisting any impulse to control or direct our inquiry, Patrice and the rest of the community also had to put up with our team's rather awkward efforts to create an appropriate research ethics framework for the trip. We wanted to be respectful, helpful, and attentive to the fact that we were invading the home of Vine's residents. And moreover, we felt it our responsibility to create work that might benefit the Vine community or animals more generally, and to contribute to ongoing discussions about the role of sanctuaries for advancing advocacy and for prefiguring justice or liberation. In other words, we wanted to take seriously the idea of animals as rights-bearing participants in ethnographic research. 
But our efforts were clumsy in a lot of ways. You can imagine a bunch of philosophers attempting field research for the first time. Um, Patrice kindly overlooked our stumbles and made helpful and constructive suggestions for improvement. I'm deeply grateful for this trust and guidance. Indeed, this openness and the willingness to let us stumble around a, a little to figure out what we were doing, uh, to let us figure that out for ourselves, uh, to me is yet another example of how Vine lives and breathes its core principles. On the original visit to Vine, I'd say that I had learned mostly from the humans, Patrice, Cheryl, Miriam. Um, I observed the animal residents and I absorbed the stories I was being told, but it was a day visit with limited opportunity to observe, engage and learn from the animal residents. Four days may not seem like much longer, uh, and it isn't, but the second experience at Vine was very different. Perhaps because we came with more experience uh, in other sanctuary settings, um, more background knowledge of Vine, and more carefully prepared uh, questions to frame our interactions with the residents. Uh, all of those things, I think. Also, there were eight of us, and we engaged in intense discussion about the experience before, during, uh, and for months afterwards, uh, as we analyzed and wrote up uh, our experience, uh, writing which further benefited from Patrice's careful reading. So all of this made for a very rich learning experience. Uh, in any case, this time, I, and I think I can speak here for my co-researchers as well, uh, felt like the animal residents were sharing with us in a more direct way, dimensions of how they were creating and experiencing community at Vine. I wanna be careful not to overstate uh, what we learned, but I believe we caught a glimpse of world making and community evolution and process. What is this process of community making, of constituting an interspecies society and culture? not just an agglomeration of individuals or the unfolding of species scripts. In the first instance, it involves both human and non-humans iteratively listening, engaging, responding, and adjusting to one another in deeply embodied and in placed ways. This process is always in media res, always unfolding, subject to the change of new members, unexpected happenings, visitors, and so on. It's a process that resonates deeply with basic insights from feminist and disability theory about the social, relational, or networked self, embodied forms of con connection, communication, and care, um, and the contextual negotiation of difference through relations of trust. Indeed, it's not just that Vine resonates with these insights, it's, it's a place where I believe we can deepen, um, greatly deepen our understanding of what these ideas mean. To give you a feel for this process, here are just a couple of examples. Uh, uh, so by recognition of mutual responsiveness, I mean instances like um, the way Vine humans, upon realizing that hens resisted efforts to approach them as they, um, uh, to, to approach them in the open, uh, to pick them up for health checks, shifted to picking them up as they exited the coops in the morning, and a process which the hens indicated they were much happier with. Now over time with countless such instances, the animal residents learn that the humans are paying attention and responding appropriately, which means it's worthwhile for the hens in turn to attempt to communicate with the humans. Gradually, such a process can lead to the creation of generally negotiated practices and recognized communicative symbols. For example, over the times, over time, the cows and humans at Vine have developed a mutual signal that standing at the gate, separating the middle commons and the upper level pastures is to be interpreted as a request to move between those spaces and communities. I could offer many such examples. And I should note that the elaboration of norms uh, and communicative repertoires isn't just about functional or practical matters or the meeting of individual needs. One of the most moving experiences uh, of the research trip was taking part in the weekly distribution um, of a spectacular array of donated vegetables from the local, local grocery store. The way that Vine uh, residents anticipated this somewhat shambolic free-for-all uh, and took joyful communal pleasure in its unfolding was infectious. And it wasn't just about the food, or at least that's how we interpreted the fact that some of the alpacas wanted to be at the center of the action, even though they weren't actually eating. So this activity wasn't just a means to an end. It was a communal ritual with meaning in itself. 
this embodied and in-place process of being, learning, figuring things out together, making meaning and negotiating difference was familiar to me from other contexts with animals, like living with dogs and to a lesser extent interacting with wild animals. But what was different during the second bond visit was the larger communal dimension. The feeling that we weren't just engaging with individuals or a group of individuals, but with a community uh, and community agency. By community agency, I mean a palpable sense in which Vine constitutes a we, or rather a series of overlapping we communities held together by the social glue of expectations, norms, responsiveness, practices. These norms like moving and touching others, uh, like moving and touching others carefully, or acknowledging someone's role as elder or peacemaker, or gathering for the weekly food fair, aren't simply about individuals treating one another respectfully. They are norms transmitted and recognized at a more communal level. There is a vine culture. There are vine ways of doing things. Uh, and these ways aren't simply imposed by human members of the community. And nor can they be explained in terms of species scripts or any other reductionist framework. Many of these ways emerge amongst the animal residents themselves and or are embraced, negotiated, transmitted, um, and reinforced by them or, or rejected by them. I've touched on only a few of these vine ways of doing things and their constitutive variety, including routines, rituals, social roles and norms around sharing, touching, deferring, respecting, connecting and caring, and marking the boundaries of, of the we community. Uh, regarding boundaries, for example, we observe norms around acknowledging and monitoring visitors, welcoming new residents, including or excluding wild animals who share the vine commons and so on. I'm still uh, grappling with articulating what uh, I've, I have glimpsed at Vine, um, but it has to do with ideas of animals and community that, as I said, are not captured by uh, ideas of aggregating uh, the knowledge, understanding and actions of the individual members of the group, nor are they captured by ideas of species norms around group behavior, which are tied to ideas of biology and evolution, nature, not culture. So the individual and the species, in my view, are both insufficient bases from which to think about what's happening at Vine. This is about collective identities, culture, and social agency, about flexibility, openness, diversity, and joyful possibilities in group life. It's about animals from different species, despite some horrific personal histories, nevertheless coming together to create new kinds of community. I think that anyone privileged enough to visit Vine can see this uh, and the fruits born from Vine's commitment to reign in the human need to design and control and to open up a space for animals as creators of complex worlds. As a political theorist, this is the dimension of Vine that is particularly exciting to me for thinking about possibilities of creating democratic political community with animals and for generating alternatives to traditional conceptions of political community that center ideas of contract and rational deliberation and the sovereign self. Moreover, Vine is illuminating not just in terms of the internal dynamics of the community, but also relations beyond and between communities with the many wild animals who live at Vine or pass through, for example. I mentioned a moment ago about norms around the marking and negotiation of boundaries. Some wild animals like wild turkeys are quite integrated into the Vine community. Others have only a passing connection or are actively discouraged if they pose a threat. This fluidity reminds me of certain indigenous ideas about wild animals as treaty peoples and of the ongoing processes of diplomacy between different groups finding ways of co-inhabiting the commons or the land, of negotiating separateness while also sharing, of understanding sovereignty and territoriality in ways that don't presuppose uh, ownership or absolutism. In short, I believe that Vine is quite simply an unparalleled place for thinking anew about ideas of individual flourishing in, in community and respectful intercommunity relations. On more than one occasion, Patrice has cautioned me about romanticizing life at Vine, uh, given the traumatic histories of individual residents uh, and ongoing effects of these traumas, the larger context of extreme precarity and violence, 
and the inevitable pitfalls of human arrogance, ideology, and epistemic limitation. Indeed, as I mentioned earlier, the founder of a Kingston sanctuary that I've had a long and fruitful association with, nevertheless does not wish me to write about the community, in part, I think, because she doesn't trust uh, my sense of possibility about sanctuaries as seedbeds of new kinds of community uh, or justice or flourishing. Humans simply can't be trusted to find a better way forward with domesticated animals. I understand and respect these reservations, but my experience tells me differently. When I visit Vine, I don't see a community we should wish out of existence. I see a community already exploring that future path with palpable energy and excitement. So while in one sense, it's a community that should never have been, should never have been necessary, in an equally true sense, it's a community that should be, um, and from which we can move forward in the spirit of those principles that Patrice first started articulating many years ago, uh, and which continue to evolve through the grounded exploration and praxis that is mine. Happy birthday, Patrice. Thank you. Patrice, maybe um, we will, since we have a little bit of time here, maybe you, you would want to say a few things about um, Sue's presentation. Okay, okay, for how long? I couldn't hear you, Lori. Oh, I said 10 minutes. No more than 10 minutes. Oh, 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 oh okay. I, 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 well, thank you so much, Sue. Um, um, I, 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 I want to thank you um, because, wait, I have to switch to gallery view so I can't see my own giant head. Okay, um, um, Sue, uh, you know, you, you, you thanked me and you thanked Vine, but, you know, we, um, we need to thank you um, as, as well. It's, it's been um, such an enriching experience for the community um, to have uh, you and your fellow researchers um, and thinkers visit the sanctuary, um, ask thoughtful and probing questions um, that um, provoke us to more clearly articulate what it is we're trying to do, why we do this or don't do that. Um, and maybe even, I mean, we are always constantly, constantly questioning ourselves, but you, you are yourself. And so you're only going to think of the questions that you have. So, you know, someone else coming and saying, oh, but what about this? Or how, uh, tell us, tell us, tell us about that um, I, I has, has been extremely um, useful in, in a practical way. Um, and it's also, I mean, I'm going to talk later. Uh, when it's my turn to formally respond about um, uh, how many of my own ideas come from like being looked at by animals um, rather than looking at animals. Um, but it's a similar, it's a similar thing for our community to have um, really thoughtful and heartfelt simpatico researchers and thinkers, you know, come and 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 spend time really um, noticing what we're doing. And then you, sometimes your interpretations have sort of entered into, you know, how we think um, about what we're up to or how we talk about what we're up to. For example, to just give one example, um, you came up with the term or your group came up with the term the commons um, to refer to this part of the sanctuary that we had just been boringly calling the front pasture or the front barn and it's and it's the barn where the, it's the special the, the special needs cows are there but so are the goats and sheep um, and alpacas one pig and then a variety of feathered friends chickens um, red hens are ubiquitous um, and then geese and ducks and 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 more 
Um, and um, of course we had, uh, we, we ourselves are, are constantly entranced by this multi-species community of that particular part of the sanctuary in which we are graced to participate. Um, but having you come and, and notice this too, and notice the ways that, you know, the giant cows are extremely careful not to step on the tiny chickens, um, even in the midst of the um, food festival, uh, and, and then for you to come up with this term, the commons, uh, to describe it. And it was just so perfect that I use it too now. Um, and um, so I, 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 I really want to, 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 to thank you for that. Um, and also um, you mentioned like our uh, uh, grace with your um, stumbling around, but right, I mean, Miriam and I used to call, what back when we were the Eastern Shore Sanctuary, we used to call it the half-assed sanctuary, just because we, uh, we were just constantly aware that we were just, just perpetually stumbling around, um, trying, stumbling our way through, trying to, using trial and error to try and, you know, figure out how to live out our, uh, what was then our motto, since it was only birds, which was let birds be birds. Um, and um, it is because of that stumbling around that, you know, some sanctuaries, as you say, might feel um, uncomfortable inviting others to witness because there's literally no way to not make mistakes. Um, if, we, if, if, we, if, we, if we take seriously the idea that to err is human, and believe me, it is, um, then you, 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 you can't possibly, we can't possibly be the superior beings that speciesism says we are, we're not. Um, and so we're gonna mess up. Um, and of course, if when knowing that you're messing up when you're in a, a, a relationship of care, I mean, it's heartrending and, 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 and you wanna hide it. Um, and, and so it's, it, it, it takes a lot of trust to invite people in. Um, and you have rewarded that trust, I guess is what I wanna say, is you have rewarded that trust by, by what, looking, uh, not just looking, but participating with such care. Um, I still remember on your first trip, I, like I made you and Will like the authors of this big fancy book. I'm like, well, if you're coming to Vine, you're gonna have to move brush or shovel shit or something because we make everybody who visits volunteer. And so I still remember you and Will moving the, um, moving the brush while Maddox, the calf, now a giant cow, was sticking his nose in. Um, um, so so it, it, I, I, I think you became part of, our, part of our making people volunteer is we want them to become part of our community rather than external observers. And you jumped right into that and have become part of our community. I do feel you to be part of our extended community. So, um, you know, of course I have more thoughts um, about the various things you've said. Oh, I also wanna thank you for the way that you've described the food festival because, um, and for noticing that the alpacas participate, even if they're not interested in eating. And, and, and I'm not sure we would have realized that this means that's a ritual that's a joyous community ritual where the glee is infectious and people want to participate, even if they're not particularly interested in the vegetables on offer that day. Um, I, I love it that you saw that and then talked about it and then now we can see it. Um, so uh, I, I have some more thoughts about other things you've said, but, but just as a direct response to what you've just said, I'm just saying, you know, thank you back at you. Thank you, Patrice. And, and thank you, Sue. That was just a terrifically um, rich, um, thoughtful, moving way to start our celebration. So um, thanks. We'll turn now to Katie Gillespie. Um, Katie is currently a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Kentucky, and she was a postdoctoral fellow um, in animal studies here at Wesleyan before that. And together um, with Katie, uh, Patrice and I put together a conference at Wesleyan on sanctuary um, that was uh, also just full of remarkable um, thoughts and ideas that I don't think we've ever really fully sort of 
un untangled um, might be a might be a future project. Um, Katie is the author of the remarkably um, moving, powerful uh, book, The Cow with Ear Tag 1389. Um, and she's co-edited three other books, Vulnerable Witness, The Politics of Grief in the Field, uh, another book, Critical Animal Geographies, Politics, Intersections, and Hierarchies in a Multi-Species World, and Economies of Death, Economic Logics of Killable Life and Grievable Death. She always has new and exciting um, ideas, writing projects, and thoughts. Um, and I will turn it over to Katie. You're muted. muted. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lori. I, I really want to thank Lori for, for organizing this event and for the invitation to speak today about Patrice's work. Um, this invitation has really been a gift um, in that it prompted me to reread Patrice's body of work and to read some things I hadn't yet read. I, I find that it's pretty rare to have this kind of time and space to move through thinking with the work of a brilliant scholar, writer, and activist across decades of writing. So the weeks leading up to this event for me have been filled with Patrice's words and, and thoughts, with a hen who turned out to be a rooster, with queer ducks Jean-Claude and Jean-Paul, with oxen Bill and Lou, and with so many other hens and roosters and ducks and pigeons and emus with enchanted forests and with cows. I thought I would try to honor Patrice's work and think with her writing by sharing a story with you from the summer. Throughout this experience, I kept being reminded of so many things I've learned from Patrice, the effects of human hubris and entitlement, the gendered violence in which our multi-species relations are entangled, the complexities of love, care, and desire, the wisdom and knowledges of other animals, the assumptions and mistakes that even and maybe especially those of us involved in feminist animal studies and animal advocacy make. I want to note briefly before I begin um, also that the story I have to tell here might be hard to hear in places, and I also want to offer a warning of some harsh language in the early part of this talk um, when I quote a farmer. So on that note, a story. My dad lives with his brother in a tiny town in north central Washington, and while my uncle was out of town, I went to care for my dad first for a couple of weeks in July and then for another couple of weeks in August. He and his brother live in the Okanagan Highlands, which is a plateau region in north central Washington spanning the U.S.-Canada border into British Columbia. It's the traditional lands of the Sinaixt peoples and all of the native non-human kin whose home this has been for thousands of years. The landscape today is composed of rolling hills and valleys, vast expanses of ranch land with cows grazing, fields of dry brown, uh, uh, dry brown grasses and hay, other areas rocky and dry with sagebrush, cliffs and ravines, rivers and creeks with reduced water flow in the summer, and patches of dense evergreen forests. Cheesaw is a tiny three block town with a general store, a mercantile nicknamed the Merc by locals, a tavern, gas station, volunteer fire department and rodeo grounds that simp empty until 4th of July weekend when the annual rodeo draws large crowds from the surrounding area. My first morning in Cheesaw, I woke to shouting from behind the house and the, so th and the sounds of thundering hooves. I rushed to the back door and watched as three cowboys and one cowgirl on horseback drove a herd of cows across the back of the property. They were struggling to get the cows to go through a narrow gateway that would allow them access to the main road, across, across which they would eventually be driven to reach grazing land on the other side of the valley. The herd was made up of cows with milk-filled udders, their calves, and young steers. The herd was in chaos, panicking and running in multiple directions, clouds of dust billowing up from the parched earth. One of the men shouted, get in there, you sons of bitches. You know where to go. Don't act like you don't. Yeah, yeah, you stupid piece of shit. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He pulled hard on the reins of the horse he was riding to redirect her to stop several cows from turning back in the wrong direction. The horse leapt back onto her hind legs with the violent jerk of the reins and lunged forward as the rider kicked hard into her sides. The woman on horseback tried a different approach. Come on, sweet bee. Come on, hun, this way. Get going. That way. That a boy. That a girl. Aren't you good? Go on now. Get. That's right, hun. 
Against the cow's harsh treatment by the cowboy, I fl felt a flicker of relief at the gentle nature with which she talked to the cows. But then I was struck hard by the gender differences in both the way they talked to the cows and in the way I responded to it emotionally. It relates directly to what Patrice has talked about in the past about the use of acts and narratives of care and kindness as ways to obscure the underlying violence of animal use. Patrice and Cheryl Wiley's analysis of 4-H and um, FFA, Future Farmers of America, America, um, for instance, articulates how notions of care, love, and connection, and although I don't believe they use this term, but sweetness, insulate farming practices from critique, and that the role of children in that case, and a woman in this case, work to subconsciously feminize or soften the actions that somehow seem so much more overtly violent when performed by an adult man. I noted the way the shift to sweetness in both tone and language instantly made me feel a tiny bit better, and that this feeling better was a dangerous mechanism through which consumers and producers are lulled into accepting the mundane forms of sexual, physical, and emotional violence to which animals are subjected in farming in any context, and no matter what kind of body is performing these acts. Eventually, the herd was driven through the gate and down the dirt road, across the one-lane highway in front of the house and to the other side of the valley, leaving behind only a flurry of hoof prints and trampled manure on the dusty ground. The ranches in the highlands are raising these cows for beef in cow-calf operations. This was a model of animal agriculture I'd heard about many times, but I'd never witnessed in such detail before. My research has thus far been on cows raised for dairy where production practices rely on the confinement of the animals to varying degrees and the separation of the cows and calves immediately after birth to maximize profit in an industry dependent on diverting milk as its core commodity into the market. Cow calf are an logic, oriented as they are around the production of beef and not milk. As the name suggests, um, herds are comprised of cows and their calves, and these herds roam across ranges, grazing and foraging for food during non-winter months until the young are either at slaughter weight at one or two years old, or until they're transferred to feedlots for longer term fattening before slaughter. Cow-calf operations involve all of the same violence as dairy and confinement beef farming, branding, castration, forced ejaculation and forced impregnation, familial separation, transport and slaughter, but they do, so, but they do so with an aesthetically pleasing veneer of cows grazing on the landscape. When the weather begins to turn cold in the fall, the cows are rounded up by humans on horseback, driven into transport trailers and delivered to one of a few destinations. Back to the ranch if they're still reproductively viable females who will be impregnated and entered into another cycle of birthing and raising a calf. Some calves might stay with their mothers for another year. Some might go to the feedlot if they're young, if, if they are young steers in need of fattening before slaughter. Some ranches send calves to feedlots at eight months of age rather than keeping them with the herd for another year. Others might be sent directly to auction or slaughterhouse if they're determined to be in a state to yield adequate volumes of meat. Relying so heavily on grazing, cow-calf operations use an enormous amount of land, and much of this land, it turns out, is public. When herds have outgrazed the pastures owned by the ranch, ranchers sometimes lease rangeland from other landowners in the area where they will graze for the season. But many herds are simply let loose on leased public rangelands. These rangelands are bounded by cattle guards on the roads, a series of metal pipes or beams spaced across a deep ditch, creating a slot slotted section of the road that cows cannot cross. But within these boundaries, they have free range of the forest and meadows. There's something to say here, I think, about land as public. It's an interesting category. The land is owned by the settler governor, government of the United States, leased for ranchers for a nominal monthly fee. In 2019, the fee was $1.35 per cow-calf pair per month. It's a kind of patriotic partnership calling up the history of animal agriculture and its central role in colonization and the formation of the settler state. Who is part of this public though, and thus who has open access to this space? If we think of the public as a multi-species public comprised of domesticated and wild animals, humans across the state, ranchers and non-ranchers, meat eaters and vegans alike, and these biodiverse ecological systems themselves, then it is this complex web of characters 
that are subsidizing the destruction of public lands in fragile ecosystems already strained by severe drought and wildfires as so many Western ecosystems are in recent years. I was surprised the first time we encountered cows on the road during one of our scenic drives. I brought the car to a crawl as we passed a young steer and his mother on the side of the road. We looked beyond them into the woods and there was a herd of cows and their calves and a few deer standing nearby. As we slowed down, they looked at us warily. We drove on. Over the course of our daily drives, we saw dozens and dozens of cows in the woods, some standing in the road, others standing or lying in the woods, drinking from the many lakes in the area and grazing on patches of greenery. They all had ear tags denoting the particular ranch they belonged to and unusually large brands emblazoned on their sides. They were property after all, and property must be marked so as not to be mistaken as not owned. In this way, ranchers appeared to not be worried about the cows disappearing. In essence, they were bounded not only by the cattle guards, which kept them geographically contained, but also by these markers of ownership that kept them conceptually and categorically contained as both farmed animals generally and as a specific property of individual farmers. Everyone in the area knew whose cows these were. The yellow ear tags were owned by one major rancher, the red by another. I had encountered cows in the woods previously at Vine, where the kinds of lives that were possible in those woods were very different, where they've been allowed to become semi-feral and to live out their lives in the ways they choose, albeit within the boundaries of the sanctuary grounds. These were not those cows. These cows, before and after their time in the woods, would be tightly controlled, violated, and killed for what they could produce. The cows in these woods seemed simultaneously out of place and in their place. I thought about how these cows could be absolutely at home in the woods of the Okanagan Highlands, living their lives apart from humans and community with other bovines and wild animals. In some ways, nothing felt more natural than these cows wandering the woods. But at the same time, they seemed jarringly out of place. In The Oxen at the Intersection, Patrice writes about the powerful fictionalized accountings that farmers and white settlers in general per perpetuate about who belongs and about who are the, the original inhabitants of a place. Narratives that erase the indigenous human communities and rich ecologies of animal and plant plant life of the so-called United States, while naturalizing what Patrice describes as, quote, the implicit whiteness of their version of rural purity, end quote, and the presence of farmed animals like cows imported as a key part of the settler colonial project as belonging to these spaces, a belief that justified, for instance, the wholesale near eradication of wolves and other predators seen as a threat to farmed animals as valuable economic assets. Once the kind of place it is has been established, white, settler, agricultural land rendered property, then as Patrice writes of Oxen, Bill, and Lou, quote, everything depends on keeping farmed animals in their place. And so this is a different kind of in their place, not in the sense of their finding themselves in a place to live that allows for the expression of perhaps their fullest selves, but as farmed individuals, these cows in the woods then are kept in their place, entrapped in agriculture, their lives and bodies appropriated for commodity production. And they are out of place. Reminders if you attend to the history of who their presence necessitated the disappearance of, of who their presence erased, and of their ancestors dispossessed of their traditional lands and relocated here. Patrice prompt prompts us, I think, to attend to what it means to be in their place and out of place. This out of placeness is all over the Okanagan Highlands if you're attuned to noticing it. Across the landscape lie thousands of erratics scattered across fields and hillsides. Erratics are rocks in the landscape that differ in type and size from those native to the area. They are rocks that have been delivered to their resting place by glaciers in the last ice age. They are both out of place and out of time, remnants of a different geological epoch, reminding us or warning us if we listen of the changing climate and the perhaps terrifying, perhaps comforting promise of a radically different future, a future that may or may not include humans. These erratics are recognizable because they are out of place, a giant boulder in a field of hay, or a massive rock in the middle of the Smeltamine River around which the waters curve and flow. 
If we anchor our attention to the out-of-placeness of these erratics, we can see the out-of-placeness of so many other things. The white settler descendants who now dominate the region try so hard to assert their right to be in this place, roaring around in pickups with dogs in the open truck bed, waving and nodding to every other white settler descendant they pass on the road, a recognition of, yes, I see you. Here we are together in this place. You and I belong here. Their cows are out of place in the woods and in the fields. Their horses waiting quietly in their corrals are out of place. Horses whose ancestors ran freely in herds throughout the West, but who are now broken, confined, saddled and bridled, alienated from generations of equine kin and employed in trying to reaffirm keeping cows in their place, obscuring the ways they are out of place. Settler structures are out of place, the barns and fencing and farmhouses, scars on the landscape. Some abandoned settler structures are being disappeared by rain and snow and wind and time. These are 1800s and early 1900s era barns, houses, whole tiny towns abandoned, their walls leaning and creaking in the wind before they eventually crumple, crumple to the ground, a pile of weathered wood. The surprising nature of the cows in the woods creates a kind of fractured reality, a signal that something is askew, that cows are not the kinds of animals you imagine seeing in the woods of central Washington. Ideas about where cows do belong might creep in with images of pastures, fields, red barns and the like. It was precisely these images that made me so delighted to see these cows in the woods, to see them living in a different kind of place, in different kinds of conditions. In the imaginary of meat eaters and enthusiastic supporters of free range beef, this is exactly the point. This farming, free range, is not that farming, CAFO or factory farming. Free range beef farming, and especially the practice of regenerative grazing, seems to be having a major swell of support as the especially high envir environmental impacts of beef production become harder to ignore in the global climate crisis. For those clinging to a future in which they can consume beef and believe they can do so with an environmentally clean conscience, an investment in a romanticized view of free range agri agriculture must be carefully constructed. Not only does this form of agriculture not harm the environment, so the fictionalized narrative goes, but it in fact helps the environment. But of course, as Vostanescu points out, this kind of agriculture is not at all environmental, environmentally sound is in no way sustainable for feeding beef to large populations, nor is it ultimately any better at all for the cows. The presence of cows in the woods also renders reality askew in a different kind of way, in the sense of cracking open an imaginary of cows living in multi-species communities of care in the woods, free from being farmed, an imaginary made reality at Vine. As we encountered these cows in the woods, the cows in the woods at Vine were there in the back of my mind. On the scenic drives my dad and I took through the highlands, we always made sure to bring snacks for the road. Apples, cantaloupe, watermelon, walk, carrots, that sort of thing. I got it into my head one day that the cows in the woods might like to have some of these treats as they were foraging the dry summer in the dry summer heat. So when we passed some cows on the road, I pulled off up ahead. And while my dad waited in the car, I walked back carefully and quietly to where the cows were standing. They were a small herd of two mothers with calves, a young steer, and another cow. They watched me warily. I stopped and smoke, spoke softly to them. I took a few steps closer, showing them the apples I held in my hands. They shuffled their hooves and continued to watch me. I took another step forward. All together, all at once, they backed off, turned, and trotted off the road into the woods. Oh gosh, I thought, and said aloud, sorry, 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 I'm leaving. I'll just leave these here for you in case you want them later. I tossed the apples into the woods as the cows stared at me from behind the dense brush. The cows I had encountered during my research on dairy had often been outgoing, approaching me from within their enclosures, coming to the fence, reaching over and sniffing at my clothing, licking my face, actively seeking out contact with me, a human. I had automatically made the assumption that these cows might be the same, but of course it was an absurd thing to expect. These were different individuals in a different geographic context with different experiences of contact with humans, and also they were different breeds. 
Although all selective breedings of bovines involves to some extent attention to what the industry refers to as temperament in order to enable easier handling of the animals and farming practices, dairy breeds in particular have been bred with a focus on docility alongside high volumes of milk production precisely because dairy production involves so much direct physical contact be between humans and cows. Cows have to be herded into milking parlors, attached to milking machines, and milked several times a day, and as such must be docile enough to tolerate this kind of constant contact. As Patrice notes in the case of pigeons, selective breeding of cows too, quote, has profoundly influenced not only the bodies, but also the psyches of individuals while, while altering the course of evolution for entire species, end quote. Like cows raised for beef, Sorry, like cows raised for dairy, breeds raised for beef are also handled at key points throughout their lives as they are variously branded, castrated, ejacula ejaculated, artificially inseminated, and then herded from pasture to woods to transport trailer to feedlot to auction to slaughterhouse. But with these cows in the cow-calf operation, there were long expanses of time when they were not in contact with humans. They lived for days and weeks and even months in the woods without humans. And then what human contact they did have would have all been frightening all of the violence of the commodity driven reproductive process and then after a long period alone in the woods humans on horseback suddenly rounding them up in a chaotic frenzy of panic and fear rumbling down mountain roads on transport trailers to one destination after another each more terrifying than the last it was no wonder they backed away from and ran off as I approached. There was no reason why I should be trusted by these cows, and perhaps I was not even a subject of curiosity given the experiences they had already had with humans. What hubris, I thought later, channeling lessons from, of, from Patrice, thinking I could just hop out of my car, walk up to these cows, my heart filled with good intentions to offer them some fruit. In her chapter, Eros and the Mechanisms of Eco-Defense, Patrice writes, quote, animals don't care about our pretty ideas or pure intentions. What matters is what actually happens, end quote. And she explains in her beautiful paper on emus that, quote, emus know what we do, not what we claim to be doing or think we're doing, end quote. What I thought I was doing was offering these cows a sweet, refreshing treat in the middle of summer, something that made me feel good to offer, and which I hoped would make them feel good to receive. But what they saw me doing was perhaps very different. A stranger, a member of a species who had delivered violence and exerted control over their lives and bodies, invading their space. My cheeks burned with a kind of shame as I returned to the car. I felt that even my presence there as a human, no matter my intentions, was a violation of their privacy in those woods, a violation of what little time they had to spend in community of other bovines unharassed by humans. I've tried since I became more aware of the way humans so easily impose themselves on animals' bodies and spaces to take greater care in not imposing myself but I was overcome with wanting to do something nice for these cows whose futures I, know, I knew would culminate in pain and sorrow that I hadn't stopped to think that my very presence as a human might just be part of that same landscape. Across her writings and talks, Patrice asks us to consider what animals see and understand about us when they look at or encounter us. In her writing on emus, she, she asks, do emus see human beings as a subset of animals who have gone wrong? Perhaps we could think about what being allies of animals who see us as the problem really might mean. To do that, we'll need to consider what emus may have learned about humans in the course of 60,000 years of eyeing us warily, end quote. We can ask the same about cows. What would it mean to act in solidarity with those cows in the woods whose histories across millennia have been characterized by human control and violence? Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka point out that it's important for us to ask what kinds of relationships other animals want to have with us. Some cows may want relationships with particular humans and others may not. So perhaps solidarity might mean working act of actively to end animal agriculture and other systems of oppression to which cows and other species are subjected. And maybe it means that when encountering cows in the woods, we leave them alone. As I started the car to continue on our drive, I saw a large black cow with a tiny black newborn, newborn calf peering out from the woods on the other side of the road. He couldn't have been more than a week or two old. 
Unlike every other cow I'd seen, he had no ear tag. He had been born in the woods and had not yet been found or noticed by the rancher who owned the herd. He started to nurse from his mother, hungrily suckling at her udder, a, trick of, a trickle of milk running down his neck. What did he then know of humans? What kind of ingrained knowledge was he born with? And what would he learn in the coming months and year or two until his death? Patrice asks us to be modest and humble in what we claim we can know about other animals and to use this humility to honor the knowledge and wisdom of multi-species others. What might emus as a collectivity know about humans, she asks, based on their accumulated experiences. I wondered over the kinds of knowledges passed down through generations of cows in these woods, about the best watering spots, about the safe areas for sleeping, about the tastiest foraging places, about what it means to be bovine kin, and about what these woods mean in the arc of their lives appropriated for human use, and about humans. And were these knowledges communicated beyond these bovine communities with free living animals in the forest? Patrice explains that, quote, humans can not only traumatize individual animals, but also over time, their cultures, end quote. What kinds of intergenerational trauma might be passed down in those woods? And what kind of profound relationships of care, love, and connection are formed away from humans during the months spent in those woods? It was July when my dad and I found ourselves in the woods offering fruit to cows and wondering in awe at the multi-species social relations unfolding under those towering tamarack trees. When I returned in August, that forest was on fire. Other forests too on my drive from Seattle had been on fire, smoke billowing up from mountainsides in the distance, a hazy fog settling in the valleys. Here we are, I thought living the apocalypse with an even more apocalyptic future looming. The valley in which Chisaw sits was filled with smoke, like a thousand campfires, the smell clinging to our clothes, the bedding, the bath towels, the orange fur of Jinsky the tabby cat. As the forest burned, animals fled down from the wooded hills into the dry valleys, the white-tailed deer and the mule deer, the moose, the wild turkeys, the bighorn sheep, the sawwet owls, and the great gray owls, the black bears, the elk, the coyotes, the lynxes and bobcats, the yellow-bellied marmots, the mountain lions, the mink and porcupines, the yellow pine chipmunks and striped skunks, the wolverines and fishers, and the silver-haired bat. These and so many other species native to the highlands would have fled. Wildlife sightings proliferated as they were pushed down to the roads and onto what residential land. Ranchers rounded up the cows much earlier than usual, transport trailer after transport trailer carrying them away from the wildfire, wildfires to their gloomy futures. I thought of that little black calf without an ear tag and I hoped wildly that somehow in the chaos of the roundup, rushed as the fires spread, that he and his mother had slipped away to a different forest, not on fire, that they found an enchanted forest like the one Patrice describes, left alone to live apart from humans, the promise of a different future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Patrice, would you like a couple of words and then we'll take a bathroom break? I feel like I need to digest that last story myself too. So maybe okay. we just move to the break. Okay, let's take a, let's, um, I want to just give everybody a minute to digest as well. And let's take, um, I, we could take a 10 minute break if that makes sense for people. And then we'll come back together. Maybe stretch if you don't need to use the bathroom, rest your eyes from the screen and we'll be back um, at, yeah, let's say 2.20, exactly. Back at 2.20 for Sil Co. For Sil Co. Yes, Yay. exactly. Yay. Okay, we'll be back.
concept of race. Sorry, is, did someone say something? No, okay. And we noticed that the social concept of race was designed to track these degrees of humanity. So with the support we found in work like that of Patrice, Black veganism was born when we made a bold move. We applied the implications of the distinction between human and human to non-human animals. We argued that non-human animals suffer injustice not simply because they are non-human, but because they are members of the group animal, the mythical analog of the equally mythical and fantastical group human. In our view, the description and explanation speciesism, though attractive, did not quite capture the magnitude of what animal suffering is. If being human matters, even in cases where only human beings are involved, then cashing out an animal ethic in terms of claims surrounding species membership really didn't make much sense anymore. Thanks to Patrice's inspiration, my sister and I saw that not only are non-human animals gendered with respect to the mythical ideas humans have created around each sex, but both non-vegans and conventional vegans alike participate in animalizing non-human animals. When the ordinary person, the non-vegan commits a moral failing, she'll invoke a sentiment everyone knows. I succumbed to the animal within me, that beast which constitutes the core of every human. And don't human beings have an animal part of the brain? Similarly, vegans themselves like to remind everyone, we're all animals. We have a shared animal condition. I'm never quite sure what these sentiments mean or how they can be in service of an animal ethic. Black veganism suggests moving away from thinking of the concept animal as a mere biological condition, since that alone will never invite feelings of obligation toward non-human animals. Rather, Black veganism treats animality as a shared social condition that many of us share with non-human animals, and that this is a stronger tool for ethical reflection. That is, in the same way that some humans are animals, and we all know what that means. So in the same way that some humans are animals, all animals are animals. If the social concept animal represents a deviation from and is antithetical to the concept of human, then what would it look like to ground an animal ethic from the perspective of those of us deemed the anti-humans? What if anti-humans laid the groundwork for anti-humanism? This is the project of Black veganism. I'm not sure I would have found my way there had it not been for that one little chapter. In closing, I want to say something about rehabilitation. It's something Patrice touches on quite a few times in that chapter. To this day, I'm impressed with the subtle parallels that she draws between the restorative process for the roosters and the accompanying restorative process she encounters in the midst of the rehabilitation project. Black veganism is a rehabilitation project for humans. In our view, veganism is not a matter of logic. It's not getting the argument right. I don't know, is utilitarianism the best tool? No, 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 maybe deontological ethics. These are ridiculous questions when debating the fate of beings called animals, the very social concept designed to represent the negation of value. These kinds of questions undermine the well of suffering most non-human animals and humans face. If we have lost the ability to feel We've lost the ability to think. We've lost the ability to want to transcend what we already are and what we have been. Then what the hell does it matter if you got the syllogism right? In my view, veganism is the restoration project. It's the restoration of those abilities. And it's not as simple as abstaining from animal products. 
it is something that takes a long, long time. It takes a lifetime. Non-human animals, these partly familiar, yet partly mysterious fellow planet dwellers, help to bring back a kind of ancient conception of human, one that's not so much interested in making objective claims about human beings per se, but more interested in thinking deeply about what it means to be human. Patrice's work has taught me that in rescuing animals and in reconsidering animals, we rescue and we reconsider ourselves. Thank you, Patrice. Patrice, do you want to make a few comments? Um, I can try, uh, but I'm just uh, blown away, um, as I'm sure as I'm as I'm sure uh, everybody else is, um, as we have been after every talk. Um, I I love it that we are thinking together. So even when we're like far apart, like I love that. Um, I love I love um, just in general uh, the the process of 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 collective cognition um, when and that's why I always I feel so hesitant always to claim ideas as my own um, because like it's just so clear to me that like things go in and then they rattle around and other things go in and they rattle around and then you know they come back and I, I often think of myself like more as a, like a conduit or something um and um so I just feel like okay now I'm thinking some new things and it's hard for me to talk because I'm still thinking about what you just said um but I I okay so I do want to say oh my god um I'm uh, like I remember I that's essay for sister species like uh, was even more past deadline um, than my essays usually are. And, and, and it was because like on the one hand, I was writing about things that I had written about before, specifically cockfighting and our rooster rehabilitation process. That's something I had written about for some other places. Um, and, um, and so I, I wanted, I was covering the same ground, but I needed to make it fresh. Um, and but also, um, and you'll probably remember because you've read it a few times. There's there's a section in that essay where I disclose, um, uh, you know, what what it was like for me when I was vegetarian rather than vegan. Um, and I'm not going to try and tell the story here. Folks can read the, the chapter for themselves. But it was pretty. Um, I had to really dare myself to do it to include that. Um, in the chapter. And so I guess to hear, um, not I guess, to hear that that essay reverberated for you so much and played a role, because you never told me this. I, I had no idea before you said this. Um, I like, wow, that just makes like every instant of labor um, on that piece, like so worthwhile. Um, I can't, I thank you a thousand times um, for, for, the, for that and for the work um, that you have been doing, um, developing um, capital B, capital V, Black veganism. Um, I'm, of course, entirely in agreement about, um, you know, animality as a shared social condition. I may start quoting you when you say, what the hell does it matter if you got the syllogism right? Um, and I, I'm just rambling on here because I'm still progressing. So I'll probably say more, I'll say more after, but um, uh, I hope that this inspires people um, to look into um, more of your writing if they haven't. And I also just want to hip you all to the uh, fact that that Syl has been making some videos about black veganism. There are several videos of Syl talking, um, and one of them is on our website, on the vinesanctuary.org website. If you go to the page called Intersections and you scroll down, um, you'll find the section on race and racism. 
um, and you'll see Sil's video right there. Um, so I really encourage you to check that out or just go to YouTube and Google Sil um, to, to understand more um, about um, uh, this developing concept of Black veganism. And I just love that you're call, talking about this as a rehabilitation uh, process. I love that so much. So uh, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. So if it's okay with everybody, maybe we'll just continue on and that'll give us more time for discussion because we're about um, 10 minutes early, but I don't think that's a problem. Do you think so, Patrice, if you agree, we should just keep going. What do you think? Okay. So do you want to introduce me or should I just go? Lori Gruen um, is an is capital E esteemed um, professor of philosophy at Wesleyan University and is always above par. Um, Lori has written or edited so many books that we will be here all afternoon if I just try to list the titles. Um, but I will say that a new edition of Ecofeminism, which he co-edited um, with Carol Adams, is coming out soon. A new book called Animal Crisis, uh, which she co-wrote with Alice Cleary, is coming out soon. A new issue of Ethics and Animals, um, the second edition, is out. And um, Ethics and Animals is absolutely the... Um, book that Vine recommends people who are, especially those who are new to thinking about animal ethics. But even if you're not new to thinking about it and you recognize that you maybe got your ideas from like Peter Singer, um, maybe it would be a good idea uh, for you to read animal ethics. Um, Entangled Empathy is another book. Um, I'm resisting the urge uh, to, to make jokes at Lori's expense. And, and instead, I, I, will, I will just, um, I will just uh, turn the floor over to Lori Gruen, also um, running the, the or, or co-chairing, or who knows what they call it in academia, the Animal Studies uh, Program at Wesleyan, for which we, ha we all have to thank for this wonderful event. Um, and Lori organized. Uh, this event. So we all need to thank her uh, for that. And that said, Lori Gruen, take it away. I think I was being very brave to let Patrice introduce me. <laughs> so I'm glad you withheld the jokes that you wanted to tell about me. Um, jokes aside, um, I've been at this work for about 40 years, over 40 years, actually. And um, I have to say that this feels, you know, you're always, we, I've heard Sue and Katie talk about the future. Um, I just have to say that I'm a real pessimist, so I don't really think much about the future, but I have to say that in the present right here, I finally am starting to feel a bit of belonging, um, much the way I do when I'm with non-humans. Um, so this feels incredible to me. Thank you all for being here. Um, to celebrate Patrice and thank, thank the three of you, um, Sue and Katie and Syl for agreeing. Um, and thank you for turning 60 Patrice. Um, this gave, cause I don't think Patrice would have allowed us to do this if she hadn't had a big birthday. So I'm really glad that you allowed us to do this. I'm gonna um, sort of take off on uh, part of Patrice's work. Um, on queering animal liberation. And Patrice often starts um, her talks about queering animal liberation with the story of Jean-Paul and Jean-Claude, um, who are the two ducks that Katie mentioned earlier as well, who survived the horrendous fragua industry. I'm not gonna be able to tell the story in as vivid a way as Patrice does, because of course I wasn't there. I've only heard her tell the story multiple times. Um, but when she first saw them having sex, this is Jean-Paul and Jean-Claude, she thought they were fighting. And um, on three separate occasions, 
Patrice separated the two of them. Um, and one of the things that's so remarkable about the story is that Jean-Claude, the way Patrice tells the story, and I, I, can, I feel like I, it's so vivid that I can sort of imagine it. She separates Jean-Claude and Jean-Claude comes back and he you know, climbs a fence and crawls under the fence and goes here and there and tries to get back with his boyfriend, um, John Paul. And, and then the quote unquote fighting happens again. Now, this is a little code now you can use privately. We're going to fight now. Um, they have, we're having sex and Patrice still thought they were fighting and separated them. And this happened three times. It's kind of, it's kind of, kind of re remarkable. And she writes, even though I knew that ducks are among the hundreds of non-human animals for whom same sex relationships are common, some combination of speciesism and internalized homophobia had led me to separate a bonded pair who remained together, it turns out, once, Patrice, once it dawned on Patrice that, wait, these two are boyfriends. Um, they got to stay together, non-monogamously, she points out. But they did get to stay together for the rest of their lives. Jean-Claude and Jean-Paul came to the sanctuary in 2002 when Vine was Eastern Shore Sanctuary in Maryland. And it was just the sanctuary for birds. And um, on Vine's new website, which Patrice mentioned, which we have um, in the um, in the chat multiple places, please go to um, vinesanctuary.org uh, for the new website. But one of the things you can now see is all of the toxin articles um, in which Patrice advances the idea of querying animal liberation over the last 20 years. And I'm hoping someday soon she'll write a book that highlights her activism and scholarship querying animal liberation because Patrice and Vine, in addition to all of the other incredibly amazing things that they do um, to help us imagine community and imagine a future in which we are able to not just uh, listen, but potentially hear what other animals are saying. Um, they've been leading the way to combat speciesism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and in addition to racism and capitalism and ecocide. So massive amounts of stuff, but I think Patrice is a, a singular voice um, in this notion of queering animal liberation. And I do hope that we can all support her in um, bringing this book to fruition. There's, there's two things that I wanna discuss briefly about queering animal liberation. Um, in the hopes that you too will start thinking about ways of to queer animal liberation, to queer animal ethics, to queer animal rights, and other seemingly radical stances that have taken on more normative frames than we might want. Queering as an intervention um, starts as an ongoing, unending longing for things to be otherwise and the joys and frustrations that unfold as one works on resistance to often unarticulated, but nonetheless ubiquitous norms. And I think fundamentally, and I'll say a little bit more about this, not a lot more about this, but I'll say a little bit more about this, that, it, that these norms, as I think still just so clearly and powerfully articulated, are often really hard to see how they're operating, these stereotypes, these ideas. And if we adopt a framework of queering, what we're doing in part is trying to interrogate how these norms constrain us, how they limit us, how they deny us the future um, that both, both Sue and Katie uh, so vividly had us imagine. Um, so the first thing uh, that I wanna say is that um, animals are queer in all sorts of ways. And this has really important implications for what some think of as natural. And this again is something that I think Patrice also um, is really articulate um, in demonstrating in her, her work. But I'm gonna just mention briefly a trans evolutionary biologist and ecologist named Joan Rothgarten, um, who wrote a book called Evolution's Rainbow. I think it's in its third or fourth edition at this point. And what she does in this book is she confesses that 
even though she studies diversity in the natural world, that's what she did for her whole, whole career. And she's retired now. She was blown away by the diversity that exists when it comes to sexuality, gender, and family in other animals. Um, there are animals that change sex, species that have three or more genders, and families that are made up of more than mom and dad, more than mom and mom, more than dad and dad, and she writes, I love this quote, it's apropos. I, I actually quoted in the preface to uh, the second edition of Ethics and Animals. The rainbow always has more colors than society has categories. I think that's just a really important uh, way of, of thinking about that. In a recent Scientific American article, um, two scientists note just how common same-sex sexual behavior, what they call SSB, um, it is um, in amongst non-human animals. And they call it, I just want to say as an aside, they call it SSB because they think that the, the concept of heterosexuality and homosexuality is um, particularly anthropocentric. I was kind of stunned to read in Scientific American that they thought that, that those terms were too anthropocentric, which was quite, quite remarkable. Um, but what they think of as SSB, so same-sex sexual behavior, can include, for example, mounting, courting through songs and other signals, genital licking, and it has been observed in over 1,500 animal species, from pi primates to sea stars, bats to damselflies, snakes to nematode worms, and of course, ducks. Um, the important, one of the other points of this particular article is that promiscuity may have been advantageous, but even more importantly, um, these scientists are now interested in thinking about the intersections of different fields of studies to try to understand better the natural world that they, they, um, they argue, uh, uh, that they're interrogating. So here's what they say. Scientists should be thoughtful about the critical lenses, biases, and assumptions we bring to the process of asking questions, designing experiments, and interpreting results. Widening the range of perspectives and cultures that have a voice in academic science is critical to the improvement of scientific practice and knowledge building. Who knows what hypothesis new voices will bring to science in the future? And I thought, wow. Who does know? There's the future again. Um, the fact that nature is so diverse and the fact that one perspective, say a scientific perspective, can't capture that diversity suggests that we really need to rethink what is natural. And this further suggests that looking at, for example, non-binary people or trans people as unnatural, much as it used to be that looking at gay and lesbian people as unnatural, reveals the speaker's ignorance of nature and of course their prejudice or intolerance. So one of the things that I think is really important and interesting about um, Pat Patrice's work um, in queering animal liberation is that she identifies the variety of ways in which what's thought of as natural and what's thought of as unnatural um, have to be challenged. And that that comes through the perspective of a range of animals. There's a, another really um, beautiful story um, that she tells about the, the late great Sharky and the late great Rocky and the late great Reddy. Um, uh, Reddy was a Muscovy duck, Sharky was a rooster, Rocky, uh, was a peacock and they all kind of collectively, I think it, they were chicks, weren't they chicks? I think they were chicks that they, um, that they raised. Um, so I think that this is these stories of the way in which um, queer communion in and amongst animals helps us to get a different flavor, a different picture of nature. And Patrice's um, work on this has been really useful and important, but nature itself, isn't something that I think it's it's useful to appeal to in ethical and political matters. 
um, which is what I want to turn to briefly now. Liberating animals, including ourselves and maybe the planet, demands that we approach our praxis queerly. And so this isn't about nature. Um, this isn't necessarily about um, sex, although it could be, um, but it's really about thinking differently about thinking otherwise, queerly inter interrogating the norms of our theory and our practice um, to try to change how it is um, that we think of the work that we're doing. When we turn a queer eye to projects that focus on the value of animals and human animal relationships and work to imagine what it might mean to improve those relationships, we need to think expansively, intersectionally and in non-normative ways. And when I say non-normative ways, I'm not saying that we're not to think of it in terms of our evaluations or our ethics. I'm thinking of the normative here, not in the philosophical sense, but in the sociological sense, what's expected of us, what the stereotypes are, what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be, as Sil was saying, we're supposed to be, I'm supposed to be a woman who doesn't like philosophy. Well, I'm a philosophy professor. I'm supposed to be a woman who doesn't like dirt. You should see my backyard. I'm supposed to be a woman um, who likes, I don't know, to look pretty or something like this. This is not something that enters my brain, but uh, these are this is what it means to be non-normative in this sense that I'm talking about now. So perhaps working together, here's some thoughts, um, perhaps working together to oppose pollution and poisoning of land and water through water protection, protection actions, say with um, the, the um, indigenous communities at Standing Rock um, would be a way of thinking about. So I wanna use this as an example of queer activism, even though it's not necessarily identified um, that way. Um, the youth um, strikes for um, climate, climate action, I think we can think of as um, a way of queering our activism. Some of the work that um, Brenda Sanders is doing, for example, and others um, making plant-based foods available in communities with little access to them. That's a, that's a way of queering animal liberation. It's a way of queering um, our practice. Um, maybe work, maybe uh, we could think of it this way. This is just a thought. Um, maybe trying to change um, the political structures that govern our interactions with humans and animals humans and animals in the environment, for example, making ecocide a crime under the International Criminal Court would be, and when I say this, I'm not thinking of it in carceral terms, I'm thinking of it largely in terms of responsibility and accountability for corporations that are destroying the planet. Maybe that could be thought of um, as queer. I wonder too about the, the bearing witness work that is done in the animal save movement protests. I think that's also possibly a useful to think of as a queer practice. And I encourage um, you to um, think about whether that is right, to develop types of queer solidarity with all sorts of people um, and who are working, who are workers, disabled people, um, homeless people. Um, animals and the rest of the world, bringing us all together in queer solidarity um, would allow us to resist the hierarchical logics of quantification and domination and incarceration. Um, and I think these are important ways of queering our practice. Part of the reason I think it's queering is it demands that we expand our imaginations to think of another kind of future that allows for less violent, more caring, less commodified, and more meaningful relationships. And I'm thinking also about the way in which um, Syl and Af think that we can all be, and we should all be Black vegans. And I want to suggest that we all could and should be um, queer animal liberationists, where we, I think, could or certainly all be committed to queering animal liberation. So in this um, beautiful piece that I recommend to you all that appeared that um, Patrice wrote in 
uh, QED, a journal of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning world making um, on the occasion of, was it the 50th anniversary of Stonewall? I think it was the 50th anniversary. Um, and this is something too that um, Katie alluded to a little bit earlier. She writes, I live in an enchanted forest. So do you. The forest is on fire. Eros can save us but only if we are willing to rejoin the joyful worldwide resistance against humdrum human hegemony. And I think this is one way um, that we should embrace queering animal liberation. Thanks. Okay, Patrice, the floor is yours. Oh, wow. Um, okay, well, I, I did write down some notes about what to say. Uh, 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 but before I jump into that, I just put the um, link to that, to that piece that you mentioned in the chat. Uh, so people can, 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 can read that. And um, Okay, I was worried I was gonna become speechless, uh, but okay, I'm gonna switch myself to gallery view because seeing my big head makes me speechless. Okay, so so um, first of all, I need to thank um, I need to thank everybody here, everybody who has come to this conference, um, uh, speakers Sue and and Katie and Sill uh, for presentation and and Lori presentations that I know because I've been scribbling down notes are just filled with so many ideas and I know have been so enriching um, for everybody who all of the attendees of the conference and 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 but you should know of course that they've been you know doubly triply quadruply so um, for me uh, because it's so um, amazing to participate in um, this kind of thinking uh, together. And I also have to thank Lori 12,000 times uh, for thinking to have this and then really pushing back against me saying, oh no, I feel really ooky, we can't possibly do something like this, I've never, you know, remotely imagined anything even remotely similar happening and no, that's too much, nah. Um, and saying, no, no, I think we should do it, Patrice. Um, so, so thank you. Um, and for all of the labor that you put into this. So um, before I respond to the particular, um, uh, what I thought I would do is respond to the uh, each talk and then also just talk a little bit about where these ideas of mine have been coming from and where they're where they're go, go, going to, I think. Um, uh, but 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 before I do that, or as a way of beginning to do that, I want to. We've we've already met um, Jean Paul and Jean Claude, um, and uh, and the the beloved bird named after my grandmother, um, and we've heard about Sharky um, and his crew, but. I, I, I want to talk to you about a bird named Che, um, who I haven't, it just occurs to me that other than in a unpublished memoir that may never see the light of day, I don't think I've written about him um, in a way that's seen the light of day. Che was um, among the first, the, 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 there was a group of three who became the third, fourth, and fifth rooster, the fourth, fifth, and sixth roosters at, at, at chickens at the sanctuary. So first there was Moselle, um, who later became called Victor, um, and then came Violet and Chickweed, um, who we thought of as brother and sister, and of whom I've written, um, and you can read on the Vine blog. Um, and then uh, we had told, this was all in rural Maryland, um, on the eastern shore, um, on the Delmarva Peninsula, uh, where they kill and cut up more than a million birds every day. Um, 
and where uh, we hadn't even yet formally established a, a chicken sanctuary on uh, two acres of land, literally surrounded by factory farms. Um, and so after, after, after finding the first bird, uh, we told the local humane society uh, that if they got a call about a bird on the roadside, um, we'd be happy to take them. Uh, and so we got this call to rescue three birds who popped up in somebody's backyard. Um, uh, I was able to discern eventually, these were three survivors of what they call the broiler breeder facilities. So these were, so they, the, the poultry industry calls those big white birds um, that they raise for meat, um, broiler chickens. And then um, of course, to get the eggs to hatch those chickens, they have to maintain these separate facilities. So the birds used for meat are killed at like six or eight weeks of age, but they have to let some live long enough to reproduce so that they can, you know, have more eggs to make more birds. And so these birds are uh, kept in similar factory farm conditions, but allowed to live longer. Um, they are typically um, the males are typically uh, prevented from eating as much as they would like so that they're constantly hungry and rageful and aggressive because um, they think that'll make them have sex more. Um, and this group, these three must have escaped the cull. You know, periodically they go through and cull any and they showed up in a, in, 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 in a, in a backyard. So Miriam and I went out, it was late in the day with cat carriers uh, to rescue these chickens. And we, and we quite quickly picked up, there were, there were two males and a female. And we quite quickly caught uh, one of the males who had um, a bit of a limp um, and the female. And then there was this gloriously large and fierce rooster um, who we couldn't catch, who kept eluding us. But instead of running away, each time he eluded us, he would circle back to stand um, by the carriers in which um, his two companions had been captured. Um, and, and he would not leave them. He would not leave them. And um, it got to be twilight and I still can see it to this day. He had this large comb and he was standing in the, in the, in the light and he was just quivering with fear um, and panting. Um, because, you know, he, we were chasing him, um, but he would not leave his companions to escape all by himself into the, into the woods. Um, finally, um, we were able to, 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 to catch him and then to bring all of them home. Um, and we called them the wild bunch and um, we called him Che. And uh, there was also Rosa after Rosa Luxembourg um, and the ill-tempered rooster with a limp was um, Fidel. Um, and, um, and you could imagine him growing into a dictator. Um, uh, and so I hope I'm telling this story well enough for you to feel how extraordinary it was for this bird chased by apes um, to just refuse to surrender his companions to them. Um, so he had my heart. So he came back and, 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 and became friends with Victor. And then he and Victor were united. Okay, if I'm, if, 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 if I'm honest, he and Victor and I were united in our adoration of Rosa. Um, and, but I couldn't help but notice that he and Victor, like they were just, you know, best friends who loved the same hen. Uh, there was no fighting. There was no, they just both adored her. Um, um, and eventually Che, like so many of the birds of this sort, he was already much older than they usually live because of being used in the way that he was. Um, he, as many of them do, lost the ability uh, to walk. Um, and so he, he, we moved him out to a separate area that we had created. It was right outside the fence of our increasingly lively 
aggregation of birds because more had come and more had come. And so by the time he lost the chance, the ability to live a couple months later, there were dozens of birds. So we moved him to the quieter area. It was grassy. Rosa was there too because she had become less um, um, uh, able. Uh, and um, we, would, we would bring uh, new rescues who were a little too young to join the crowd um, there. And Che would, he could just barely get around. Uh, but when the young ones came all scared um, and um, he would lift up his giant wings and they would crawl under um, in the same way that a mother hen, I've actually never seen a rooster do it. Uh, well, not, it's not quite, I'll get there. Uh, but in the way that a mother hen would do, he would lift his, giant wings and these quite large baby birds would, would get under them and stick out. So he wasn't really comfortable, um, but he would shelter them and you could tell that it soothed them. And of this too, of course, was this was contrary to, you know, stereotype of rooster. Um, and then, um, And then Che became the first um, chicken at the sanctuary to die. Um, and he had he had not he had not been with us but a few months. It was a summer day. He had oh he used to share his blueberries and other things with the young ones. Um, and 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 Victor would come um, on the other side of the fence, and they would all socialize. And so one morning he was there, and then one afternoon he was dead. Um, and I went inside and after burying him, and maybe that way, maybe it was this day, maybe it was the next day, the next morning, the next morning, Victor came out of the coop and he walked over to where he used to stand to socialize with Che and he made the saddest sound that I've ever heard before or since not seeing his friend. And so I remember being inside and I remember thinking, I have to write an obituary. And I wrote an obituary. I, I had to tell the story of this bird. I had to write, he had to live on. People needed to know um, that this person had existed with these characteristics and he could not be just gone. But of course there was nowhere at the time, this was 2000, if there were blogs, I didn't know about them. Um, we had the most rudimentary website. There wasn't any publication that I knew of that I could publish such a thing. So I wrote it. And that was really, the beginning of the process that like culminates in today. Um, this, because it was the, it wasn't just that I wanted to tell the story. It wasn't just that I wanted him to be remembered by his name Che, but there were things that I was learning that whether or not I wanted to tell the world, I was obliged to tell the world somehow. Um, now, as it turned out, Shay was not the last rooster to lift his wings because one of the roosters, one of the little birds that he had sheltered, um, Charlie Parker, um, uh, ended up himself in the sick bay and himself did the same thing. And so I think it was Sue. Yeah, Sue talked about the culture here at, the, at Vine. That culture started with Che and it still persists 20 some years later. So he did live on, but you know, today I'm realizing that 
you know, okay, so I wrote that first thing and I just couldn't get any traction or get anybody to read it and nothing happened. But it turns out that some of the other things that I've written um, did make it out into the world and, and have entered um, the consciousness of such extraordinary people um, who then take those ideas and, and mix them with their own and do things with them. And on Che's behalf, I'm very glad about that. Um, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to realize that that has happened. Um, so to the, to the, to the, to the, to the talks, Sue, I have already thanked you, um, right after your talk, but I'll reiterate the thanks for anyone who missed them. Um, it's been extraordinarily helpful, uh, to me personally as a, as a, as a thinker, writer, whatever, uh, activist, um, but, and for Vine as a community, uh, to have invited you, to have you come and ask your questions and tell us how you see us. Um, and and thus have allow us to see ourselves and to see what we're doing and and to have uh, the things that you say about what we're doing make us think okay well how can we do that even better because that sounds great what Sue says we're doing that's cool okay let's make sure we could do that even more right um, uh, um, so I've already thanked you for that. I've thanked you for understanding our stumbling around um, praxis, um, which has been our praxis. And, um, and, and now I, I think I'm not sorry that that's our praxis, um, stumbling towards whatever we can do. One thing that I, jumped out at me um, of, of what, what you said um, that, that's, really to the point of some of my current preoccupations is when you challenge the notion that we can think our way to the answers. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm more and more convinced we cannot think our way uh, to what we need. Like whatever we need to do is much more embodied. Um, I mean, thinking is also embodied, right? It's a myth that it doesn't happen except for within our bodies, but still. Um, we have to feel our way and we have to use our hands to create the way. Um, and not everybody has to do everything and, and we have to dance our way and, and move and art. And um, so I thank you for mentioning that and, and I wanna echo it, um, especially uh, to everybody who, um, perhaps is not interested in philosophy or perhaps is not interested in writing things. Um, uh, that's not like writing things, to me, the writing of things, um, well, to me, the compress, making things into words that then have to be like said in order um, is already compressing them. But at least when I'm saying them, I can also gesture and I can send you my energy and my, my, my expressions. Um, uh, but then when to, to, to put it just into writing, into words on a page, that really compresses it. Um, and, and we can only communicate some of what we need to communicate to each other that way. So, so for anybody who is thinking that that's not their way, but, but maybe art is or dancing is, oh, and I know that Sandrine Schaefer is here who uh, curates our art, Artists for Animals series. Um, um, I, I, I think we all need to be doing all those things uh, to, 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 to reach the answers. Um, Katie. I couldn't even talk when you finished your story, your your story, and I know that everybody, many other people, I saw the chats uh, were deeply moved. Um, I thank you for um, using the the story that you told is like a case example of some of the things I've been trying to say about um, 
the roles, um, uh, yet another way that animals have been impressed into service, impressed into services as symbols of whiteness of, of, or, or the rightness of white settler colonialism and how that plays out in that particular place. But what really struck me, and I know struck everybody else, was your um, the story when you return and the forest is on fire. And Laurie quoted uh, from that, that piece I wrote, this is something I've really been trying to hold simultaneously in my hands, in my head, in my heart. One, I live in an enchanted forest. We all do. The trees are talking to each other underground right now. When we take a breath, we're breathing in the exhalation of those trees. Um, there are just a multiplicity of wonders going on all around us every day, whether or not we're aware of it. Um, and if we tune into it, that, that is what we need. Um, so, so we live, I live in an enchanted forest. I want, I want to remember that. I want to hold it in my hand. And at the same time, I have to remember and hold in my hand, the forest is on fire. And, and, and I think that letting the forest is on fire make me forget it's an enchanted forest. No, because knowing it's an enchanted, that's what's going to give us the ideas that we need and the energy that we need. Um, the tuning into the larger than human world, um, tuning into, now I'm skipping ahead to Lori, but tuning into that longing, that, that's the word that you used, Lori, longing for things to be otherwise. Tuning in to that longing and having that longing for things to be otherwise be our fuel and seeing the enchanted forest and all of the ways that for other animals, things are otherwise, um, seeing all of the otherwises in the larger than human world um, is what's going, if anything could, then I think that's what will enable us to put out the fire. Well, I skipped around. I hope that's okay. Um, so I, I'm so um, smitten with your work. And I, to know that any of my work played a role Wow, like that's that's the best, right? That's the thing you're hoping for um, when when you do work that like you, you, you um, or and back to Stu stumbling around, like every time I write something, I'm forced to publish it even though it's flawed, terribly flawed. Um, and it, and 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 um, this really helps me to remember, and I hope this will help other people to remember, you know, especially folks who are, you know, um, maybe newer to, to, to putting their ideas out there um, that don't wait for it to be perfect. Like if I waited for it to be perfect, um, then I would have just blown completely past that deadline. And there, there wouldn't have been that essay, um, uh, which, which it's so, I, I don't know. I just, I, I I'm so excited. Uh, from, by the things that I've seen of your latest work, and I can't wait to see uh, what comes next. Um, and um, and 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 I'm thrilled uh, for any way uh, that I um, that my ideas have 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 been part of yours. Uh, and that's true for everybody here. Like the the as I probably have already said, it, 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 it always feels wrong um, for me to like claim ideas. Um, I, I have no, I don't even know how like people who write music do it because like, how would you know that a melody wasn't something you had heard before? 
Um, I, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm thrilled that we're here together, that we're thinking together, and and I'm always excited um, to have our idea to to be part of a process of collective cognition. Um, which brings me to Lori and querying animal liberation, because I'm really clear um, that any of my ideas about querying animal liberation are a product of, uh, at this point, multi-decade process of collective cognition, where I've gone around giving workshops where, you know, and sometimes it's me giving talks, but sometimes it's me just like doing, okay. I mean, I know the first few, it was just, I remember one time in Salt Lake City, and I was, we were at a gay community center and about half of the audience were queers who were not animal liberationists. And about, no, maybe a third of the audience were queers who weren't animal liberationists. A third of the audience were animal liberationists and vegans who weren't queer. Um, and then a third of the audience was queer vegans, right? Um, and, and I was just like, okay, so, okay, homophobia, speciesism. What are some connections we see? Uh, animal liberation, queer animal liberation. What are some connections we see? And so I couldn't possibly at this point like disaggregate the things that I independently thought all by myself um, from all the things that I've heard people say um, at workshops or events like that. Um, I love the quote that Lori said about the rainbow having more colors than, than we have categories. And I'm also super aware that the rainbow has more colors than we can see. Um, and that that means we absolutely must uh, be consulting um, folks with eyes that are different than ours um, because they literally uh, can see things that we can't. I'm reminded of this every single day in the chicken yard when you see uh, hens um, or roosters pecking at nothing. In fact, they're pecking at microscopic minerals that they know are good for them, um, that the sense organs at the tips of their beaks tell them are things they should take up, and we can't even see. Hmm. Also, Lori. Yes, I will write that book that you are telling me that I should write. That is the next book. I've started to work on the next book. Um, and it's the book that Lori told me to write. Um, and it might seem passive to just like let somebody else tell me which book to write. Um, but I like to think of it as going with the flow um, because if I was the kind of person who um, didn't do that, I mean, I found a chicken by the side of the road and it changed my life. I let that change my life um, uh, completely. Uh, and, and when I think about Vine and the ways that we've moved, it's been true for everybody who works at everyone who's here at Vine allowed their... Um, meeting with some non-human animal uh, to absolutely change the course of their lives. Um, and at every phase, we have been stumbling around and responding to conditions, responding to needs right now, today, We're dealing with the death of an exceptionally dear sanctuary resident. And Cheryl is right now picking up a hundred birds um, from a nearby town um, who've been seized by authorities due to cruelty. Um, so part of sanctuary work is just responding um, rather than saying, no, no, my plan is to do this. Um, I hope I'm not rambling too much. So along the lines of, of 
making sure I don't make claims that that of ownership. I just want to say a few more words about like where the ideas in the various writings that people have been quoting come from. Of course, I didn't find that job was I was in my late 30s when we found the first chicken. And so it's not like I came uh, to this work as a naive as a naive person who knew nothing. I was um, someone who um, in my um, graduate training in clinical psychology had 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 learned um, how to listen very carefully um, uh, in a full bodied way. Um, and and to listen to others, not just for what they say, but what they didn't say, and 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 to and to be fully present to others, while at the same time always holding right back here an awareness of your own biases, your own pre-existing ideas, um, your own um, things that might be skewing your interpretations, um, and I think that really helped me um, be able. Uh, to make sense of what happened when the first bird who I thought was like my grandmother started crowing. Um, and I um, had worked in um, anti-racist education and um, various other uh, progressive uh, feminism uh, within the way of doing things that um, I guess today folks say intersectional, we were using the older term, the interconnectedness of oppressions, but still I was pretty um, skilled at seeing how what might seem to be different forms of oppression relate to one another. And so it was, it was fairly natural uh, to, um, when finding myself in poultry country, uh, to, to see uh, the ways that this particular state of affairs um, um, simultaneously harmed birds and workers and the environment uh, while contributing uh, to capitalism in certain, not just uh, economically stratified, but racially stratified ways. Um, and, um, and in my work um, in the 90s and in, in late 80s in ACT UP, I had learned um, uh, that activism really can save lives. Um, and that being really creative in, you know, your direct action uh, can save lives. And in my work at a tenants union, I had learned um, that the syllogisms don't matter as much as like, you know, keeping a roof over people's heads. Uh, so, so that was where I came from. And then, you know, we found the chicken. And And I'm not sure who said this, but I know that in Lori's um, previous work, uh, I forget which chapter it is, maybe it's in The Ethics of Captivity, um, another book of Lori's that I forgot to mention. There are too many to mention. Um, uh, she talks about uh, respect being, um, you know, not only uh, ob carefully observing with empathy, but being willing to be looked at, being willing to be regarded. Um, and so I wrote down here looking both ways because I feel like it's not like I've just been like standing back looking at animals and learning from about them or even from them, but that there's been these relationships um, in which um, uh, I participated um, and, and, and was, you know, willing to be seen and to think about what I look like um, to other animals. Um, I wrote down here the lumbering lummox um, because um, I'm pretty sure that's what the ducks are thinking when they're talking smack about me. Um, um, but jokes aside, a big part of what I've been thinking has been, what do animals, what might other animals know about us, know about humans, um, 
that we probably ought to know about ourselves. Because like as we're meeting here, there's a bunch of other humans meeting in Glasgow. And I don't think we need to wait for the end to call it the failure that it will be. So what I've been thinking a lot about is what are humans really like? If we, if we set aside, like we often think about speciesism you know, as telling lies about animals, right? But speciesism also tells us lies about ourselves. Um, what are those lies? And, 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 and if we set them aside, then, then what are humans like? And, and are there things about what humans are like that we need to be thinking about as we try to um, um, mitigate some of the harm um, that humans have, have been doing? then what can we learn from the larger than human world, including but not limited to animals that might help us solve some of those problems? And then um, in closing, I'll just go back to, and then the other thing that I, uh, so I'm, I'm really thinking about those things and why I'm going to agree with Lori that the next book is Queering Animal Liberation is because I think that, that we need to queer climate activism. And I don't just mean LGBTQ people doing it. I mean queering every aspect of it. Um, and I do believe I do believe that our longing for things to be otherwise, our wish for better relationships with other humans, better relationships with other animals, better relationships with the other than human world, I do believe that that wish for relationship is stronger than anything. It's true, I often do tell the story of Jean-Paul and Jean-Claude, who, just to be clear, Laurie has him climbing a fence, but actually what he did was walk through a field, climb a six-foot fence, walk through the woods, take a sharp left turn, walk down the road, make another left turn, walk up a driveway, and then climb one last fence. And he did that three times after an AP barely knew kept separating him from his boyfriend. And I imagine the courage that that took. And I ask myself, what would give somebody that courage? And it's because he wanted to be with his boyfriend. And we all know that wanting feeling that longing feeling, and it doesn't have to be about a sexual or romantic relationship, but that wanting to be with, that wanting to be in relation, like that is stronger than guns or governments. And, 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 and so I do think um, that that, which you can call Eros, is a source of our most sustainable and powerful source of energy and that anything that we can do um, to tap into that for ourselves is gonna sustain us. Um, and anything that we can do to call to that longing in other people uh, is gonna be a particularly helpful way um, to inspire um, humans to, to act less harmfully. So those are the things that I wanted to say. I want us to still have time for discussion too. Um, and also I need to pull back from the sun in my eyes. Uh, so, so thank you again to all of the speakers. Thanks to Lori uh, for organizing. Um, and I'll really look forward um, to, uh, to, to the discussion um, in, the, in the time that we have together. Thank you so much, Patrice. Do any of um, 
do any of Sue or Katie or Syl, do you have things that you want to say? Questions or comments that came to you while you were, that you go, oh, I wanted to say this too. Or I want to ask this, or I want to think about that. And everybody else who's here, please put your questions um, or comments in the chat. Patrice, can you move? No, you can't. You're mute. I'll figure it out. Okay. There, I just had to move the whole table. <laughs> Sweater. Thought. Well, um, Patrice, I wonder if you, um, you, you just, you said, um, I think things that you've also written about both in the, um, the Stonewall article and also in your ecofeminism, uh, that your chapter in the ecofeminism volume about Eros. Um, I wonder, and so that's a, I think that longing is a tremendous motivation um, but I wonder if you can sort of think about optimism, pessimism, sort of given Glasgow, given the forests on fire, and sort of, can you give us some ideas about um, how to think less catastrophically, or should, is it okay to think catastrophically? Just love to hear your thoughts about that. Okay. Um... So I, I think back to, to what um, Sue said about the paper that I wrote about um, stretch, strategic thinking in animal liberation. And one of the things that I said was, you know, um, it's not useful to sort of categorically say, you know, uh, this or that tactic is, is, is the best, um, that in fact, we need to look more carefully um, at particular things. And I feel sort of similar about hope versus no hope um, in that um, I think that's a bit too global. Um, and um, I'm, I, I think I, I'm more interested in like, well, well, okay, so what are, what are specific things um, that, um, uh, we can imagine happening or not happening and you know what's the likelihood or not of those things happening or not happening and 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 where can we um, where can we um, ex expend our our energies um, I, 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 I'm suddenly reminded of um, and I'm not going to quote it right um, but something that Angela Davis uh, says is that it's super important um, to never presume um, that what is, is what must be. Um, but the, you know, what is, is what is right now. Um, and now I'm going more to me, uh, one thing that I know is true and we often bemoan is that change happens constantly regardless of, of anything. Um, and so there's never, to me, it's never a question is of there, will there be change or not? Because there will be change. There's always change. Change is constantly happening. And so the question is, um, how do you, um, in what directions will the change go? And if you lean on the boulder rolling this way, can you, to divert it to rolling that way. Um, and so we're definitely in a situation where there are several big boulders that um, it's pretty hard to imagine um, uh, uh, anything intercepting their, um, their uh, passage. But what 
that's not to say um, that nothing will. Um, I want to say this too. Um, so, so first, I, I, I sort of reject a bit um, global hope versus not hope or optimism versus pessimism. Um, mm, I do think it's important to um, challenge our imaginations. And then, you know, just because I can't imagine um, a solution or I can't imagine things going this way or that way, uh, recognizing that might be a fault in my imagination um, as opposed to a realistic assessment um, of the situation. Um, but I, 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 I'm hesitating, I'm sorry. There's like a fight going on in my head behind, like on the one hand, I wanna answer this question, but on the other hand, I feel sort of obliged to say like, here, here are some things that I've learned from animals about this, okay? Um, and, and so the first group of battery hens that we um, welcomed to the sanctuary uh, were uh, hens from, from battery cages uh, came in, in our very first year, not long after Che died. Um, and I don't know if anybody has ever met um, hens like the day after or the day that um, they leave uh, one of those factories. These were birds who were spent and thus would have would have been, you know, trucked to a landfill otherwise. And uh, they were, some of them, they didn't even seem like birds. They were like, they seemed almost like monsters. Like they, 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 they the, most of their feathers were missing and um, they were unnaturally pale. And um, they're like, as you pick them up, you were mostly touching skin. Um, and, and, and there was a, there was a way that you, I, I remember feeling sort of ashamed that I had to work really hard um, to like have compact, to, to feel warmth because like there was a way you wanted to pull back from how horrible this was um, from these monsters um, and, and to see them as birds, um, the birds they were and hold them and, and carry them in. And, so they had all spent a couple of years in an egg factory. And when they first, um, uh, we carried them into the coop, they just, they didn't know what to do. And so they just, they just, they just, they just stayed together in a heap in a corner of the barn or the garage that we were calling a, a chicken coop and just slump together. And so, we put food and water, you know, a little ways from them, a few steps away from them, and then, um, and then a few steps from there, and then, you know, towards the door. And gradually, what happened was that one hen or then another um, staggered forward and found the water. Um, or found the food and then others saw that she had done it and, and staggered forward as well. And, you know, gradually, 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 um, they found their way, you know, to the door outside for in some, and by gradually, I mean, you know, over course of, for some of them, a couple of days. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, so first it's water and then it's like food. And then it's like, what sunshine? grass you know and the good news for them was that they um in a matter of weeks or in some cases months became among the wildest birds um at the sanctuary they would perch um and they were so eager to get outside every day um that they would literally hit me on the head swooping um, you know, when I would open the coop door, they would just immediately swoop and hit me on the head on their way out, on the way out the door. Um, the same hands. 
But when I think when I when I think about the particular day, like nothing in their lives, their two four, told them that there would be water, that there would be food, that even sky existed. And so much is the same way as when we learn about these amazingly queer ways of being animals. Um, things that you can't imagine might still be true. Things that you can't imagine might still be true, including good things. Um, and the other thing that I noticed is, um, and this comes, and this will come close to what I've learned from emus too, is that um, it's not like these birds felt hope and then went looking for sky. Like they took a step and then took another step and stumbled upon and then took another step and stumbled upon. You see what I'm saying? Um, um, there was no internal feeling of hope that led them to take these steps that in fact did lead um, to um, what they were wishing for. And so I think that if there is such a thing as hope, it's an action rather than a feeling. And it's doing things in service of um, what you hope for, um, regardless of whether or not you feel hopeful. Um, at least that's what I try to do. Um, and that's sort of similar, Katie mentioned the EMU paper, another absolute failure in terms of writing as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I, I liked the talk that I gave um, before I wrote the paper. Um, and and um, here we have a situation where there are birds who are millions of years older than humans. They existed long before we evolved, then we came and fucked everything up, first once and then again, um, bringing them to, to the brink of extinction twice. The European settlers at one point even waged a war on them, the Emu War, shooting at them with mechanic with machine guns. They were literal, literally dodging bullets. And here they are. And how are they still here? And they are still here, I'm pretty sure, because they didn't think about whether or not they had hope. They just made the path that they needed by walking that path. And I'm sure that some of those emus are not with us because they tried to make the path and it wasn't the right path and they did not survive. But, um, but some did and they did it by walking. Um, so I guess that's, that's how I feel about hope or not hope. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, but I, wait, wait, I'll just say this too. I, I never hoped that an event like this would ever happen. <laughs> well, I couldn't have imagined. I never it imagined <laughs> anything even remotely similar. So yet more evidence that things we can't imagine might still come true. And perfect ending. Um, to a really, really wonderful um, afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Sue and Katie and Sil and happy birthday, Patrice. Please do um, go to the Vine Sanctuary um, website and if you can donate, let other people know um, about, um, about the, the goal for the month to try to um, raise some funds. And we're just so thankful that Patrice is here and that Vine is here. So much of an inspiration. Thank you, Patrice, and happy birthday.
Thank you. Thanks. Thank you again, Lori, for organizing for all the speakers and to all the attendees. It means the world to me. Thank you.